Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another edition of AUHSD Future Talks. I am your host, Superintendent Michael Matsuda, the Anaheim Union High School District. And as our audience knows, the show is all about the future of education. We've had wonderful, amazing guests. Uh, and today we are blessed with um, our very own Kelly Gallagher, who now is retired. And he's written a number of very influential books. And he has over 100,000 Twitter followers and has been in, I don't know, 47 different states and many countries. Kelly, welcome to our little show. Mike, it's always good to see you. It's always good to be home at the Anaheim Union High School District. A, a slight correction, I'm, I'm retired with a lowercase r uh, from the day-to-day -day work, but I'm still doing some work with your teachers and uh, I'm still out on the road a little bit. Yes, you are. And if we have time, we'll get into that a little bit because uh, you have a, a, just an a amazing, crazy road schedule. And I don't know how you do it, but you and it's international, international. So I wanted to start with one of your with your latest uh, book, you and uh, your writing partner, Penny Kittle, uh, Four Essential Studies, Beliefs and Practices to Reclaim Student Agency. Um, why, what is this book about and why is it, I'm reading some of the reviews and it's just amazing, transformational. Um, and this is the only book you need to read and right. practice. I mean, just amazing, uh, reviews, Kelly, why this book and why is it important now? Well, for those of you listening who do not know me, I did teach 35 years uh, in the Anaheim Union High School District, uh, all, all as a high school teacher. And what I have found kind of near the tail end of that 35 years was that there was sort of a gap and not necessarily in Anaheim, but in my travels around around the country and, and beyond that what was being taught in high school uh, in sort of a traditional sense, did not adequately prepare kids for the, either the university or for the workplace. And so there was sort of this gap. Um, I co-wrote that book with my friend Penny Kittle. And Penny, who is in her 40th year of teaching, has taught elementary school, middle school, high school. And for the last few years, she's been teaching freshman comp at the university. Uh, and what Penny has discovered is, is she's received wave after wave after wave of kids who all got A's and B's in K-12, all the way through K-12, and they get to the university and they cannot handle the reading and writing demands. So there's, there's this chasm or this gap between, between what's happening K-12 uh, in a lot of places. And of course, I, I do believe very strongly that Anaheim is way ahead of the curve and doing a lot of innovative things. But in a lot of places, kids are coming out of K-12 and they're unprepared for the next step. So we sat down and thought, okay, what are those elements that kids are not getting? And what, you know, it, kids are different than they were three years ago, right? And so we want to, you know, we're teaching kids first, not stuff first. And so we want to be responsive to the world. We want to be tuned in uh, to their literacies. And so we wrote a book called Four Essential Studies, where we argue it's time to rethink the essay. Um, it's time to work in more uh, choice reading. Uh, we want to honor their digital literacies. Uh, and we want to, in the English world, we want to elevate poetry because it's kind of been put on the back burner in the shadow of all the, you know, high stakes testing. So what does it mean to rethink the essay, Kelly? Well, um, one of the reasons kids are not successfully transitioning from K-12 to the university is because when you get to the university, uh, they do not accept formulaic writing. They do not accept the five paragraph essay. Uh, and that, you know, when we have kids who come into our school systems who do not write very well, there is a mindset that, well, okay, to help this kid become a writer, I first need to teach him formula. And then once the kid sort of gets the formula, we can wean the kid, kid off of that. We disagree with that. We believe as early as, you know, second, third, and fourth grade, kids, you know, it, 
the way you learn how to ride is you stand next to somebody else who knows how to do it. And it's, that's how we learn anything, right? Um, we stand next to somebody who knows how to do it. Uh, you know, you looked up something on YouTube. I bet you the people listening to this, almost every one of them has looked on YouTube to, to figure out how to do something, right? Well, that's the same thing with riders. They don't need formula. They need to see what the thing looks like. Uh, and then they need to emulate it. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of teachers out there with very good intentions, but we have found that kids who get to college are not used to making their own decisions when it comes to writing. And if I say to you, please turn in a five paragraph essay, I've already stripped you of much of the decision making that goes into to putting that essay together, the sequence of it. And, you know, it, the standardization of it is not what's valued post K-12. You know, I go back to your early writing, Read Aside, and when you were, I think that was published right after 9-11, you had a lot of stories about that. And uh, you talked about, I, you, even back then, you were talking about sort of this moving away from formulaic writing and sort of, uh, and I know as, an, as a fellow English teacher, I was concerned too about this movement away from narrative and sort of an integrated uh, approach to expression. Um, I'll never forget, Kelly, you, there, are two, there are two concepts you brought up way back then uh, about sort of writing small and funneling, but writing small, the concept was, you know, instead of writing, because the, the, you, you had kids study and write about 9-11 and you know, of course, there are 3,500 people who died, and you could be very sort of um, objective and far away from talking about that. That's kind of writing big, but writing small w was about the, uh, the the husband waking up every day and leaving. He was a, a chef at 90 at one of the at the uh, World Trade Center, 110 stories up, and uh, leaving the toothbrush with that with that toothpaste on it and i still remember that today and that just shows how powerful that is in terms of uh, the approaches to writing because we do tend to be very formulaic and just kind of cya in writing and that's not sticky enough for kids you raised a couple of issues there and so this idea of writing small doesn't mean a small font it means taking a a, a minute moment um and again, you remember that toothbrush anecdote from years ago, yeah. right? Um, and, and the other thing you mentioned, which is kind of interesting, is in American schools, which I think is a mistake, there's sort of this uh, view that the higher you go up the K-12 ladder, the less important narrative writing is, the less important story is. It's not as academic as literary analysis or expository writing but i i just simply disagree i think the i think the first of all the ability to tell a story whether you're a football coach a hotel manager an uber driver whatever the ability a politician the, the ability to tell a story is is really really important and what 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 i was doing at magnolia when i left Sorry about that. What I was doing at Magnolia when I left was, you know, my kids would write the traditional argument. But once they had like, OK, here's what I believe and here's reason one, here's reason two, here's reason three. Then I'd have them go out in the world and find a, 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 a person whose, whose story supports that argument. You know, in the real world, arguments weave in stories. Right. And if I teach you at the, even at the beginning of 12th grade, I was still teaching narrative because if I teach you to tell a good story, I'm strengthening your ability to argue later, because when an argument comes down to a human being, uh, it becomes much more uh, compelling. Uh, and the other thing is, if you if I teach you the number a bunch of skills that you have to attain to write a good narrative, strong voice, use of metaphor, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, that list of skills that you're going to learn when, when, when writing a narrative, those skills are not genre specific. Those skills will carry with you 
when you write an argument, you want you want you know sensory detail, you want use of metaphor. All those things they're not they don't sit and, and be, are are not left behind. But as you progress as a writer, you take those skills with you. And I've always believed, especially with reluctant writers, is that we start with them uh, because they have stories to tell only they can tell. And that's why they're reluctant, right, oftentimes. Right, because the writing for them has become a, a school thing. It's become an extraction exercise where read chapter four, go go pull out these three things and prove to me that you've read it. That, that's, that's very different than generative writing. Uh, the idea that that when you write, you know, that the act of writing itself will lead you to unexpected places, right? And so if I gave you a prompt and you started writing for 10 or 15 minutes, at the end of that 15 minutes, it's very likely you will find yourself in an unexpected place. So we don't write just to prove we know stuff. We write because it helps us explore our thinking and it generates it's generative it generates thinking we did not know we had 10 minutes ago so i don't i i think there's a there's a difference between compliant writing and engaged writing and if we want to start with engagement we have to start with the kids worlds well and i think that's why you've been so successful at a place like magnolia because here you are six foot white guy coming into a school that is very diverse. And really, uh, just so our listeners understand the context of Magnolia, it is the most impacted McKinney Vento. There are kids living in motels, sleeping on the floors of apartments, and yet they come in, as you just pointed out, I mean, uh, taking on some really big issues in a very sophisticated way. But the teacher, Mr. Gallagher, starting with their stories and who they are. And I think that you're obviously you're onto something really big here and um, a lot of people are responding to it. I wanted to go a little bit into some of the other essential skills. Um, the poetry, poetry is all around us yet we don't really acknowledge it as poetry. Could you uh, uh, expand on that and what you mean by poetry? Well, I think I think kids kids are afraid of poetry because I, I don't know about you, Mike, but when I came up through school, the teacher picked the poem, the teacher had the answer behind her back, and what we did is we read it and reread it and reread it until the point we tried to m match the answer that the teacher had, right? But poetry is also a real, and you know, kids are afraid of it. A lot of teachers are afraid of it because it's so nebulous. But we have found that poetry, I mean, kids love music. They love lyrics, right? Uh, we have found that especially spoken word poetry, yeah. uh, where, where you can see it performed, is again, I, I don't show them a spoken word poem and give them four questions. What I do is I you know, give them a spoken word poem and we pick a line or a phrase or an idea, and then we explore what we think about it. I, I don't, you know, to get kids to quick write, to get kids, you know, to reestablish writing momentum and to reestablish writing fluency with kids, I don't think there's anything more powerful than poetry. And I think what's happened in the testing world, high stakes testing world, especially outside of Anaheim, because you've been really good about the dangers of that, but I think in the high, high, high stakes testing world, uh, you know, it poetry is that thing. If you get to it at the end of the year, uh, okay, we have two weeks left. I'll, I'll do some poetry. Whereas I believe very strongly that poetry is foundational to a good English language arts classroom. You, you wouldn't have a math class that ignored division, right? And so I, I believe that and what we talk about in the book is ways of approaching poetry. I know this is revolutionary, but you know, we want joy in the classroom. We want kids to, to write their own poems. We want kids to perform. 
I think you walked into my class one day when a kid was performing a poem. It's very uh, cathartic. And I think you would argue this again, why this book, your book uh, is resonating across the country because it's very healing at a time of post pandemic. It's all kinds of crap out there for this generation. And it's what you've tapped into is the emotion, the allowing the kids to emotionally express, which is very healing. Let's move into another area that you touch upon. I think it's this, this in the age of AI and all of this is really, really going to be big. Digital composition. What do we mean by that? What do you mean by that? And why do you feel that that's resonating? Well, uh, digi digital composition unit that we talk about, and which I've done a few times at Magnolia, uh, both in my own classroom and as a consultant to the district, uh, is this idea that the decisions you have to make when you make a two minute movie, what's my sequence, how should I start, what's the music, what's the angle, you know, it, the decisions you make to create a digital composition are the same decisions you have to make when you write an essay. Composition is composition, right? But our kids live in digital worlds. And so I, I could tell you lots of stories about graduates who that when they got jobs out of high school or out of college, they had to, they have to present, uh, you know, they have to make little, little, little movies. Uh, they have to make, you know, little presentations. Um, and so, we believe, like, I believe very strongly that the curriculum should be, and I used this phrase earlier, tuned in to who is sitting in that classroom. And, you know, to do another big core literary work and write another five paragraph essay, when kids are, are pulling out their phones and creating their own TikTok videos in, in two minutes, uh, ignores the brilliance. It ignores the skill set that's in that classroom. And so I believe also, you know, where we're heading, the ability to, to, to make uh, either animation or small films is, is just incredibly important for kids. And, and again, a highly motivating uh, unit for kids to participate in. So you talked about generative ideas, right? Whether it's on paper or digital or spoken, what, I'm sure you're getting this question asked all the time. What is the effect of AI in the ELA world? And where do you see that going? Is that something we should firewall or we should bring in? Or what, what, what do we need to do about that? Yeah, it's really early to see where it's going to go. But my gut instinct says embrace it. Uh, it's not going away. I, I use it. I use it all the time. So why why would we not show kids how we use it? Right. It does. You know, I get the idea. The concern, of course, is going to do writing all the writing for the kids. But I actually think, you know, it's a, a, it's an argument uh, for more of a workshop kind of class, because if your kids are writing in class every day and and I'm conferring with them, I'm shoulder to shoulder. Hey, how's the essay going? I see that essay developing in front of me. I'm going to know the kid's voice and I'm going to know when it's not the kid's voice. But I also think, and and I, you know, talking to your curriculum specialist, Mike Switzer, and some of the teachers in the district, you know, the tool, uh, for example, you you have a you have an essay, you have a draft, and then you feed it into you know Chat GPT, and you say, give me some revision suggestions. There is some value there that's really really rich. Um, my concern, of course, is that I would rather the student like when I even when I'm in person with a kid and the kid is asking for help on an essay, it's always the writer in my classroom who determines the one thing she wants me to look at. So, Mr. Gallagher, will you look at X and I'll give that feedback to that paper? Well, I think that's the way it should be tweaked in the chat GPT, because when you put in an essay and say, give me revision suggestions, it gives you two and a half pages of, of suggestions that, that may or may not address what the writer's concern is. My concern is it's another way of stripping the decision making of writers. But I think there's a real power there that if, if it's used judicially and correctly, can really, really be a, a, an amazing tool. We, nobody knows where this is going. Well, it, it's what's happening is it is an iterative 
process, right? And, and bringing that tool in and teaching kids how to use it that way, but kind of rewriting and editing, right? On the flip side, I think we're having teachers, especially English teachers, give feedback with AI tools, which is really, really making um, the job of feedback um, uh, more robust and more effective and efficient. I would say though that the feedback feedback whether it's teacher or ai generated is much more valuable to the writer when that feedback is provided mid-process not hey i've i finished a draft now help me make it better but as, as a mid-process my concern there is and 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 this is really really important you're right because the People out there don't realize how many students an English teacher has and how many essays there are to read. And so I think that's going to be a real value in helping take that load off the teacher because it's not possible to maintain that pace with 150, 180, 190 kids. Uh, but the concern I also have is that it strips the teacher a little bit of agency because the way I, the, when I sit down with you, if you're my young writer, sometimes i have to talk to you for a minute or two or three before i go oh that's the thing that we should be focusing on here and i don't think chat gpt gets that i mean it just gives you a list of stuff you can do to make it better but i i think it's a much more personalized when it's when it's shoulder to shoulder with the teacher you know in the minutes that we have left the fourth area that you talk about is book clubs um in in the book why why is that important now and um book clubs have been around forever but why do you want to double down on book clubs i have found you know as somebody who taught ninth grade forever and 12th grade forever i i conferred with my readers every year and let the, the kids are not doing the reading they're finding spark notes. They're finding the thinking online. Uh, again, reading has become an extraction exercise for them. It's become a school activity, not something you would do on your own for fun, right? And so what I think what's happened here is that, especially post pandemic, when some kids didn't read at all, right? Is that now you have kids come into your class and you're going to teach one book to the entire class. Well, I have kids in that class who can't read that book. They're not at that reading level, right? And so this one size fits all is problematic. Uh, the other part of that, of course, is I have found the number, there's many, many tools that a teacher can employ to motivate adolescent readers. But for me, number one, was giving them choice around a set of really interesting books uh, and let them choose which one. So what I suggested in our book, 180 Days, is that the reading diet in school is out of balance. Uh, and so we blend, we mix core works, independent reading and book club reading, but it was the book clubs that really really motivated a lot of my students to get on board. The other thing I would say is, and maybe this is too much of a bird walk, but one of the reasons kids hate reading is because reading has become, you go read chapter one, I'll give you four questions. You go read chapter two, I'll give you three questions. Uh, and so what we're finding is that the problem is that when kids get to the university, all reading at the university is independent reading. So if they've not been used to actually reading, that they they have a really really big issue with you know they can't they can't do the pace of it. So we have to get we have to reestablish reading identity and reading momentum. And for me, it was book clubs that was most likely to do that. So on that note, you and Penny have um, you're, you're taking on a sort of a national book club, right? Um, and um, there are uh, teachers on the East Coast and some on the West Coast that are involved with this. Could you um, go a little bit deeper in terms of sharing why do you feel that we need to um, embark on this? 
we live in an age, uh, unlike any, any time else in my career, where there's a lot of book banning, uh, a lot of, uh, and, um, don't get me wrong, I think as a parent, you have a right to say, I do not want my child to read this book. And I respect that right. But you do not have a right in my mind to say nobody else can read the book, mm -hmm. right? And so in the shadow of all of this book banning, uh, I, the project I propose and I'm going to start next week in the Anaheim Union High, High School District is that we have selected some diverse books um, around the concept of revolutionary characters. Uh, I think it's really, really important that it doesn't come from a teacher, that it doesn't come from a brave librarian, but that it comes from a system like AUHSD who publicly says, uh, we believe that kids should have access to diverse books. So um, we're gonna start this with a, a bunch of seniors next week. And those seniors are gonna have choices of books about revolutionary characters, but those senior, those high school kids in Anaheim are also going to read the same books at the same time as high school kids in Maine. And those two groups are also going to read the books with a third group of college students in New Hampshire. So students in New Hampshire, Maine and California will be reading the same books at the same time and we will be conversing via video we'll be conversing via shared google docs we'll be writing back and forth to one another because you know one thing is you could have diverse books but if all your kids are from anaheim and there's a there's a huge diversity there they're still kind of in this anaheim bubble they're gonna not see the books the same way the kids are who live in maine right and so I believe not only in diverse books, but in having discussions with those books with people who are unlike you and live in a different place and have a different point of view. We've done this twice in Anaheim um, uh, in various projects, but I'm really looking forward to this because of the theme of revolutionary characters. We're hoping to do this over the next five or six weeks and then uh, I'm going to present the findings of it uh, at the national conference uh, in no national English teacher conference in, in November. Wow, that's uh, very exciting to be part of this. And I know the, the books have all been vetted by our um, internal system, as well as it is, I'm sure, across the country. These are seniors, they are choosing the books in this book uh, study and uh, really excited about uh, Hearing those results, because I would totally agree, the uh, students from diverse areas across this country talking about their own experiences, but through the lens of these um, revolutionary heroes. Well, I think there's two problems, you know, with kids who have stopped have stopped reading. One is they don't see themselves in books. They don't see themselves, and number two, they don't they don't see others who are very different than them. You know, you might get that one kid who just wants to read a football book and then another football book and then another football book. And that's fine that that kid's in a reading lane because we want to get every kid in a reading lane. But once they're in reading lanes, we want them to get in other reading lanes because the research is really, really interesting. Um, kids who read the most fiction grow up to be adults who have more empathy for other human beings. Uh, and so that's that's one of the byproducts that, that comes from a, a book club experience like this. Why do you think um, some of these politicians are banning books? Well, uh, that's an interesting uh, question. I think um, some of the books may run afoul of their religious beliefs. Um, I believe uh, a lot of times the books are misunderstood. Um, you know, it always, you know, and I get it. And I, I, I understand there's a different point of view, I'm not going to try to change somebody else's mind, but this idea that kids should not be exposed to bad language or should not be exposed to real world books. Th these kids already know this I mean, they already know the world they live in. And to me, 
when you read a tough book in class, that is the opportunity to have a meaningful, reasoned discussion about you know what what we're reading. Um, I just think, and I remember when my own kids were in elementary school. You know, some parents didn't want realistic books. I wanted I wanted my kids to read as many realistic books that was possible that were appropriate at their grade level. Why, why do you think schools should be teaching empathy or character education? Do you think that's part of the, I mean, you know, um, your, your point about kids being exposed to fiction or narrative genres, um, you know, uh, increases empathy. Do you think that that's something important? Uh, I would just say take a look out your window take a look at the world that we live in today. It's more important now than ever before. We live in a very contentious, divided, I'm not gonna listen to you, you're not gonna listen to me uh, era. And to me, I think, you know, when I think of all the good teachers I had in my life, it wasn't the teacher who taught me to kill a mockingbird. It was the teacher who taught me to kill a mockingbird and why that's important today. And why, you know, why this book is lasted this long, because there is something universal in there that is worth thinking about and worth exploring. I, a book like 1984 is more relevant today than when it was written in 1948. Um, Kelly, uh, last, but you, you, you know, spur deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, but I want to, um, is, do you see a relationship between empathy and democracy? Oh, I think the lack of empathy, the lack of dis civil discourse. I'll, I'll tell you one story. When last time I did a book club uh, with, with a high school in New Hampshire, we had written a piece. Uh, the assignment was to write to a decision maker and and try to change that person's mind. The decision maker could be your principal, it could be the president of the United States or somebody in between. Well, my kids wrote their drafts and they sent their drafts to New Hampshire to have the New Hampshire kids read their drafts. And my colleague Penny was standing in class when one of her kids opened up this assignment and the kid blew up in class. And I hadn't vetted that essay when it went out and the first line was and this was when president trump was running for office the, the first line said dear donald trump if you want to make america great again please drop out of the race immediately and the kid who opened it was a huge trump fan a kid who believed that you couldn't build a wall fast enough and so this gave us opportunities for me to say, well, why would a kid in New Hampshire have a different point of view than you? And for Penny to say, why would a kid in Southern California have a different view of immigration that you did? It, it, and, and it was an opportunity to, to say, I'm not trying to change your mind, but I want you to listen and have civil discourse between one another. And if it doesn't happen, if kids aren't taught that in school, where are they going to learn it? They're not going to learn it by by getting on social media. You know, Kelly, that, that story gives me chills because it also gives me hope for what you and so many English teachers across the country are attempting to do. There is a relationship between teaching these uh, essential studies and uh, really connecting that to uh, this great experiment uh, called democracy, which uh, hopefully by 2026, we reach our 250th anniversary. On behalf of uh, Americans struggling with what it means to be America across the country, I want to thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, for having me. Again, it's, it's always a pleasure. AUHSD has, has been my home since 1985, so appreciate it.